this morning, Joshua chapter 17, verses 14 through 18. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. Then we're going to go back and read Joshua chapter 17, verse 17, just for emphasis. So we're going to put that into our gospel blender and mix it up and read it as one giant pericope. So here we go. One, two, three. Let's read. Then the children of Joseph spoke to Joshua, saying, Why have you given us only one lot and one share to inherit, since we are a great people? Inasmuch as the Lord has blessed us until now. So Joshua answered them, if you are great people, then go up to the forest country and clear a place for yourself there in the land of the parasites and the giants, since the mountains of Ephraim are too confined for you. But the children of Joseph said, the mountain country is not enough for us. And all the Canaanites who dwell in the land of the valley have chariots of iron, both those who are of Beth Shin and its town and those who are of the valley of Jezreel. And Joshua spoke to the house of Joseph, to Ephraim and Manasseh, saying, of God, little children, and over overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And Joshua spoke to the house of Joseph, to Ephraim and Manasseh, saying, You are a great people and have great power. Let me read that again. You are a great people and have great power. I want to speak this morning from the theme, hashtag greatness. Somebody say greatness as you go to your seats. Eternal God, our Father, we ask for your anointing, your blessing, your peace, and your power upon this word. Sit David below down, dear Lord, and let your spirit stand up in me. God, please don't teach a good word. Please don't preach a good word. But teach and preach a word that will do us some good. Let it touch you. Let it heal. Let it deliver. Let it lift the burden, loose the shackle. Let it set somebody free. Let it save. Let it sanctify. And also let it edify. In the name of the Lord Jesus, somebody holler, Amen. Amen, amen. This, 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 this morning's message is a hybrid message. It's a little preaching. It's a little teaching. It's a little black history. It's a little lecture. It's, tell somebody it's a hybrid. It's a hybrid. It's a hybrid. So y'all ready to get into this hybrid word? But before we get into this word, Maria, I need to tell somebody to confess right now. Open up your mouth and confess right now that there is greatness in me. Oh, y'all didn't even say it like you meant it. I need somebody who really believes that there is greatness in you to open up your mouth and declare there is greatness in me. I need somebody to understand no matter who you are, 8 to 80, blind, crippled, or crazy, red, yellow, black, or white, wherever you are from, whoever your mama was or was not, whoever your daddy was or was not, I need you to know that there is greatness in you. Somebody needs to holler, there's greatness in me. And, and I can prove it to you from Scripture because the Word of God says in 1 John 4 and 4 that we are of God and we have overcome. Are there any overcomers in the house? Is there anybody here who's made it through some stuff that has taken other people out? Is there anybody here who's made it through some stuff that you don't even know how you made it out of except for the good hand of the Lord has been upon your life? He says you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because... Because he who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. I need somebody to know that he who is in you is the greatness that is inside of you. Somebody shout, there's greatness in me. The greatness of the Holy Spirit is inside of you and me. That's why the Bible says in Philippians 1 and 6 that we have to be confident of this very thing. That he that has begun a good work in you shall complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Is there anybody here? who believes that God is working something good in your life. I need you to declare he's working something good in my life. There, there's a gospel song that takes this scripture and it says, Ernest Pugh says, he that has begun a great work in you. Is there anybody here who believes that God's doing something great in you? Yes. Beloved, understand. That's why 1 John 3 and, 3, 3 and 2 says, beloved, now we are the children of God. 
and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he appears, we're going to be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Let me push this thing a little bit further. Matthew chapter 11 and 11, Jesus says this. He says, truly I tell you that all of those who've ever lived, there's none greater than John the Baptist. He says of all the people who ever lived throughout history, he says there's none greater than John the Baptist. But do I have any born-again folk in the house? That means saved because we don't use that term anymore. Do I have any saved folk in the house? But look what the Bible says. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Of all who have ever lived, none is greater than John the Baptist. But he says, yet even the least person in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he is. Y'all missed what I'm saying. What Jesus is saying is because you've been born again by the precious blood of the Lamb, even though John was great, you are greater. Tell somebody there's greatness in me. Luke, Luke 7 and 28 says the same thing. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Tell somebody there's greatness in me. 2 Samuel 5 and 10 says it like this. It says, and David became greater and greater. He didn't become greater and greater because of who he knew. He didn't become greater and greater because of who he rolled with. He didn't become greater and greater because of his family line. It says, but he became greater and greater because the Lord God of hosts was with him. Tell somebody, the thing that makes me great is not my pedigree, but the thing that makes me great is that the great hand of the almighty God is upon me. Tell Somebody, there is greatness within me. I, I think, Pastor Joshua, somebody almost has this. Let's look at two more. Luke chapter 17, verses 20 through 21. Jesus was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come. He answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. Nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. I need somebody to understand that the greatness of the kingdom of God is all up inside of you. Somebody needs to lift your hands and declare there is a kingdom inside of me. And wherever you and I go, the kingdom of God comes with us. Somebody does not understand what I since there are about three or four people in this house who have been living below your potential because you don't understand that you are a carrier of the kingdom. Look at your neighbor and say, I am a carrier of the kingdom. And when you are a carrier of the kingdom, you walk differently. When you are a carrier of the kingdom, you talk differently. When you are a carrier of the kingdom, you act differently. Is there anybody here who believes that you are a carrier of the kingdom? Elbow somebody say, you are a carrier of the kingdom of God. Wherever, oh, hallelujah. Wherever, if I'm at Target, the kingdom of God is at Target. If I'm at Publix, then the kingdom of God is at Publix. If I'm at Chick-fil-A, then the kingdom of God is at Chick-fil-A. I need somebody to understand that the kingdom of God is in you. Tell somebody there's something great up inside of me. So look at this. That's why Paul says, now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you could ask, imagine, or think, according to the power that works within. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the power of the kingdom of God. Is there anybody here who understands that where we end is where God begins? Let me say that again. I think somebody on the left got that rook a rook a rook. Where we end is where God begins. Who in here has a major dream? Who in here has a major vision? Who in here has major thoughts? I need you to know that that's where you end. Where you end is where God begins. And God says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that vision and exceed your every expectation of what I can do. But first, I've got you to believe. i got to get you to believe that there's greatness in you. I don't know what folk have told you, but somebody needs to understand that there's greatness in you. The only reason you and I have have survived to this moment is because God wants the greatness within us to be revealed to the world. Tell somebody there's greatness in me. Elbow three people say there's greatness in me. There's greatness in me. There's greatness in me. That's why the Bible says in Job chapter 42 verse 12. Job chapter 42 verse 12. It says, now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 100 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. 12 verse the 8 portion says, now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job better than his 
former days. I need somebody to know. I got to go Martha Menenzi up in here and tell somebody that your ladder will be greater. Elbow somebody say, my ladder will be greater. Is there anybody here? Is there anybody here who messed up your former? So your former doesn't count anymore. But tell somebody, I'm stepping into my ladder. I'm stepping into my ladder with the knowledge of the kingdom of God. I'm stepping into my ladder with the anointing God, the anointing of the most high God on my life. I need somebody to declare that there's greatness in me. Somebody holler, there's greatness in me. Somebody help your neighbor to understand that there's greatness in them. Somebody holler, greatness. So, so as we come into our text, beloved, Joshua and the children of Israel are passing out parcels of land because they've come into their promise. Tell somebody they've come into the promise. And so they're handing out parcels of land to the different tribes and the different groups that have come into their inheritance. And the children of Joseph have spoken up because the children of Joseph have gotten their parcel of land and it doesn't have the square footage that they imagined. And they're like, uh-uh. This ain't it. Because every now and then, beloved, you have, to, you have to dream big enough to recognize that I'm not settling for less if God has promised me more. Y'all not hearing me up in here. Tell somebody, I'm not settling for less if God has promised me more. And this is not just materially. Because sometimes we limit God to the material. But I'm not settling for less if God has promised me more, not just materially, but supernaturally. If God has said that I will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover, then I'm going to keep laying hands on the sick until they do recover. If God has said that greater things than these shall I do because he's going to be with the Father, then I'm going to keep operating with the realm of greatness until I see greatness manifest in my life. If God says I can speak the word and it will obey, then I'm going to keep speaking the word until it obeys because I have greatness up on me. I will not settle for less when God has promised me more. Is there anybody who can say I know that's right? Too many saints of God are living below our potential. We should not get to the point where we are surprised by the miracle, but we should live with an expectation of the miracle. The surprise should be when the miracle does not happen. That should be the surprise. What? It didn't happen? We should not be surprised when God shows up. We should not be surprised when God makes a way. We should not be surprised when God opens the door. Hello and here's somebody. So, so the children of Joshua spoke up. They said, Joshua, Joseph, I'm sorry, Josh, Joseph, do you know who we, they said, I'm sorry, the children of Joseph said to Joshua, take two. Children of Joseph said to Joshua, Joshua, do you know who we are? You know, why have you given us only one lot and one share to inherit? Since we are a great people, in as much as the Lord has blessed us until now. Is there anybody here who has an impressive resume with the most high God? Oh, don't be shy. Throw your hands up. Tell your neighbor, I have an impressive resume with the most high God. Is there anybody here who's seen and pay $800 worth of bills with a $1.99 worth of money? Hello and here's somebody. You know what? I, I know this is way off the subject. I went to the mailbox the other day. Yeah, amen. I went to the mailbox the other day. And it's like, it's like God is better than Siri. Because I had just been complaining to my wife. I said, you know, automobile insurance is too high in Florida. I was like, it's too high. Shouldn't cost that much for two people to drive a car. And don't add on some boys under the age of 25. I said, it's too high. Just too high. Went to the mailbox the other day. Got a note from Liberty Mutual. Damn, Mr. Blow, your insurance is too high. We have adjusted your rate down. Y'all not hearing me up in here. Expect a check in your mailbox within 10 days. Y'all not hearing what I'm saying. When you have an expectation of this is not how it's supposed to be. And you stand on the boldness of the word of God. I hear the praise team stand back here and say, things change when we call your name. Is there anybody here who believes that things change when you call on the name of Jesus? So they say, Josh, they say to Joshua, 
Why have you given us one lot? Inasmuch as the Lord has blessed us until now. So Joshua answered them and says, if you are a great people, do something. Look at them say, do something. If you are a great people, then don't just give God a bunch of lip service, but step out in faith. If you are a great people, then go up to the forest country and clear a place for yourself there. Right in the land of the parasites, right the mosquito bites and all the other people. And the giants, since the mountains of Ephraim are too confined to you. In, in other words, he said, if you believe that you deserve more, then walk in your more anointing. If you see, first verse, verse 15, verse 14, that's why they say, in as much as he has blessed us until now. What, we have to stop starting over every time we go into a new place. Hello in here. Every time we go into a new place, we don't bring the faith from the last season with us into the new place. We go back to the beginning. But what God wants us to do is God wants you to go back to the day you first met him. And think about everything that he has done from that day until this day. And be able to say the same God who brought me through this, who brought me over that, and who brought me into this is the same God who can take me further. My God is too small. My God is too big for me to settle for small. Yeah. Woo, y'all making this hard, y'all making this hard, but we're going to get this. So Joshua answered them, if you're a great people... Go up to the forest country and clear a place for yourself there in the land of the parasites and the giants since the mountains of Ephraim are too confining to them. But the children of Joseph said this. They said, guess what? Mountain country, not enough either. And all the Canaanites who dwell in the land, in the valley, have chariots of iron, both those who are in Beth Shean and its towns and those who are in the valley of Jezreel. And Joshua spoke to the house of Joseph, to Ephraim and Manasseh, saying, you are a great people. Notice this. He says, I'm coming into agreement with what you said about yourself. But I wasn't going to come into agreement with you about what you said about yourself until you had the ability to say it about yourself without being prompted. <laughs> Hello in here, somebody. Donnie McClurkin says in one of his songs, it's not wrong, dear. I belong here. Beloved, you and I have to get to the point where we understand that there is greatness in me, on me, and all over me. Somebody say that with me. There's greatness in me, on me, and all over me. Joshua says, yes, ta-da, you are a great people. But not only are you a great people, but he says, but you have great power. Look at your name and say, you have great power. Tell somebody, that's called the anointing. So you have great power. And he says, and because you said it, you shall not have only one lot. We're going to leave that here. We're going to come back to this. He's verse, verse 18. Then he goes on to say verse 18. He says, but the mountain country shall be yours. Although it is wooded, you're going to be able to cut it down to its furthest extent shall be yours. And you will be able to drive out those Canaanites, though they have iron chariots and are strong. In other words, because you finally come to believe that God's promise is not for everybody else, but God's promise is for you too. I need you to elbow somebody and say, God's promise is for you too. God's promises are not just for Pastor Joshua and Pastor Blow. God's promises aren't just for Dr. Danita and Lady Kenya. God's promises are not just for the praise and worship team. God's promises are not just for the ushers and the diaconette. But you need to know that God's promises are for you too. Elbow to my say, God's promises are for me too. I, I may not even be able to, I may not even know where to find all God's promises in the Bible. But I know they are for me. Hello, and here's somebody. So, so Joshua calls the children of Joseph, he, he calls them a great people. He calls them a great people. So I had to ask myself, who, who are these children of Joseph that Joshua calls a great people? And you have to go back to Genesis chapter 41, verse 45. And in Genesis 41, 45, it says, and Pharaoh called Joseph's name. Zaphneph Paneah. Now you know Joseph was one of the children of Jacob for, for, our new, for our new saints in the house. Joseph was one of the children of Jacob and, and he had this dream. And he told, he shared the dream with his haters prematurely. Because sometimes you got to sit on stuff for a minute before you share it with everybody. But God is such a good God that he can cause all of our stuff to work together for the good. 
So, so long story short, after going through many dangerous toils and snares, Joseph finds himself as the prime minister of Egypt, second in command to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh hooks Joseph up. Not only does he give him his own four by four to ride in, not only does he have a police squad riding in front of his four by four saying, make way, make way. He gives Joseph his dope signet ring and he says, now we got to find you a wife because a prime minister can't be single. And so the Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphneth Panea and he gave him a wife, Aseneth, the daughter of Pontifera, the priest of On. So Joseph went out all over the land. Now later on in Genesis chapter 41, verses 50 through 52, the Bible says unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, who Aspheneth, the daughter of Pontifera, priest of Orm, born to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God has caused me, caused me to forget my toil and all my father's house. And he named the second child Ephraim, saying, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Now, moving forward, it comes to pass in Genesis chapter 48, verses 1 through 5, it says, after these things, Joseph's dad got sick, and it was told to Joseph, your dad is sick. And Joseph took to his daddy his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And Jacob was told, look, your son Joseph is coming to you. And Israel strengthened himself and sat up in the bed. Then Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at the land, in, at Lutz in the land of Canaan. We're going to, somebody say Canaan. And bless me and said to me, look what he said. He said, behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you. I will make you a multitude. Somebody say a multitude. A multitude of people and give this land to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. Now, Jacob is one of the three patriarchs of the Old Testament. There's Abraham, there's Isaac, and there's Jacob. Jacob is one of the three patriarchs of the Old Testament. And this is what Jacob says to Joseph in Egypt. This is what Jacob says to Joseph in Egypt. He says, now your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born to you in the land of Egypt, before I came to you in Egypt, I reckon as mine. There is much mine as Reuben and Simeon. Y'all missed that. He says to Joseph, this, these two boys that you had in Egypt that were born to you of this black African woman in Egypt, I reckon these two boys to me as mine. They are as much mine and have as much right to the inheritance, uh, to the inheritance of the Israelite people as Reuben and Simeon. Somebody missed that. Let me see if I can fix that. Throw up slide number three. The, the mother of Joseph of children was an African Egyptian woman named Aseneth. Jacob the patriarch had no issue over the fact that Ephraim and Manasseh were children of an African mother. Because we have to understand, beloved, that modern racial prejudices did not exist before the 14th century. So the racial prejudices that we ascribe are absent to the people of the Bible. Y'all missing this. And the Bible is not a story of one group of people. The Bible is a story of a mixed multitude of people because God loves diversity. If God didn't love diversity, he would have made everybody green and everything green. Y'all not following me. So here we go. Here we go. So Jacob says, these two children born in Egypt to a descendant of Ham shall be mine. Because in Jacob's time, this was no big deal. But in our time, it is huge. Because we see the clear African heritage of two tribes of Israel. Not just two, but there are more. But we're focusing on these two here. So understand, look at somebody and say, your history is an inheritance from God. And beloved, you and I, the Bible says, teach your children. Beloved, we cannot hand over the teaching of our heritage to the state. Hello. Just because a governor says you can't teach something doesn't mean that you can't teach something. Y'all don't hear me up in here. Tell somebody, you and I, the reason that slavery was made so effective, according to John Hope Franklin and according, according to John Henry Clark, was because you stripped a people of their history. And a people who have no history think they have no place. And beloved, you have to be careful about what's going on in our nation right now. I'm not trying to get political. But if you have over 44 state legislators trying to outlaw 
and ban the teaching or seriously alter the teaching of history of African people. It's not too long before you devalue the existence of these people and you shackle them up all over again. Tell, some, tell your neighbor, I know it's tight, but it's right. That's why no matter what your DNA, you have to say, no, we are a great people. And I will tell my great story because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Somebody shout hallelujah. You know, I watched, I watched Apollo 13 a few nights ago. Well, at least a little bit of it. Well, actually, Apollo 13 watched me. Let me tell the truth. But there's a great theme theme in Apollo 13 where Jim Lovell and them are, are lost. And they're trying to get back to earth. And they're doing the math in the, in the capsule to get them back to earth. But the story fails to tell you that they didn't get their math right. That it was a little black woman at NASA headquarters that went and got her math. that got them back to earth. Tell somebody, we have to tell the whole story consistently. Let me, let me. So here's the shout. Here's the shout. Joseph, Joshua, who was Moses' right-hand man, the one who led the children of Israel into the promised land, was also of the tribe of Ephraim. Someone said, ooh. Joshua was of the tribe of Ephraim, which meant Joshua descended from Aseneth, an African-Egyptian woman from the land of Han. This is one of the reasons why when enslaved Africans learned how to read English and were able to read the scriptures in English, that the narratives of Exodus and Joshua, found, they found liberation in there, not just because of the liberation story, but they recognized the people in these stories. They recognized these lands that the Bible described. Come on in here, somebody. So, so Bible says, Genesis 17, 14, the children of Joseph spoke to Joshua saying, why have you given us only one lot and one share to inherit since we are great people inasmuch as the Lord has blessed us? And Joseph spoke to the house of Ephraim and Manasseh saying, yes, you are a great people. Understand, he's taken to his own people. Joshua saying, yes, of all these tribes, you are just as great because I'm a part of you. Y'all missed that. Beloved, you and I have to begin to tell our folk, no matter who our folk are, whether they're folk that, that match up with you ethnically, whether they're folk who match up with you spiritually, which is more important, that you are a great people. I need you to elbow a fellow believer in this house and say you are a great people. Tell somebody, like the song worth, tell somebody, he thought you were to die for. Oh, y'all missed that. Somebody just tell your neighbor. Say, neighbor, you have so much worth that Christ thought you were worthy to die for. I need somebody to lift your hands and say, I am a great person. And look at the neighbor saying, yes, great people make mistakes. Has anybody made mistakes since you woke up this morning? Great people don't always say it right, do it right. But we have to stop letting our mistakes override the greatness that is in us. That's a trick of the devil. You messed up. You said a cuss word. You cut somebody off in traffic. You went out on a date with the wrong person. You used to swing on a pole. You used to smoke weed. Now God can't use you. That's a lie. God can use you even more because of who of your testimony. Paul was a murderer, but yet he wrote the majority of the New Testament. Is there anybody here who knows that God can turn your mess into a treasure? Somebody shout hallelujah. Tell somebody, stop hiding your testimony. Let me get back into my word because I'm getting off track. So Joshua spoke up to the house of Joseph, to Ephraim, to Manasseh, saying, you are a great people and have great power. Mm -mm. You shall not have only one lot. Joshua was speaking specifically to his tribe, to his relatives, to his family. He says, I know we are great people because I know where we came from. I know we are great people, and I know we have great power. I need you to elbow your neighbor. Say, neighbor, I know you're a great person, and I know you have great power. Find the person behind you. Say, I know you're a great person, and I know you have great power. Find someone else. Say, I know you're a great person, and I know you have great power. Point at somebody on the other side. Say, I know you're a great person, and I know you have a great power. Now confess for yourself. Say, I know I'm a great person, and I know I have great power, and I 
might need you to tell somebody. And in this season, the power of the Holy Spirit that has been laying dormant in my life is about to come forward full blast. Tell somebody, I know that's right. Elbow somebody, say, I've been sitting on my gift. I've been sitting on my anointing. I've been sitting on my calling for too long. But tell somebody, this is the time that I step out and I walk in everything that God has called me to do. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hey, do me a favor, Tom. Do me a favor, Tom. Do me a favor. Turn off those lights and, 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 and y'all turn off the lights up there. Turn off all the lights in the house. All right. Close those doors up there so you so just turn off all the lights. Every place there's light, turn it off. Except the exit signs. Now guess what? This is the way most of us operate. Most of us operate in darkness because we have what is called potential energy. We have potential anointing. We have potential Holy Ghost power. But because of what people have said to us, because of what people have done to us, we refuse to operate in our power. So even though the power is there, we refuse, we refuse to flip the switch. But I need somebody, help me out in the booth and help me out of the door. I need somebody to stand on your feet and say, let there be light. Say, let there be light. Let there be light. Let there be light. Let there be light. The light is the power of God that is operating in you. Elbow your neighbor, say, you and I have been operating in darkness too long. Somebody say, let there be light. Tell somebody the power is there. You and I just have to activate it. Tell somebody you've been you've been laying you've been laying low for too long. But I need somebody to say I'm stepping into my greatness this day. Don't you realize, you may be seated, don't you realize, beloved, that God has raised you and me up? We've been called into the kingdom for such a time as this. Don't you know that the book of Revelation chapter 11 and 12 tells us about these two witnesses who they, nothing, nothing they do to them can harm them. And if anybody tries to harm them, fire comes screaming out of their mouth because they had that much Holy Ghost power and authority. And don't you know that God has set us in the earth and has set us in the kingdom for such a time as this to be those great people, to be those great powers. If you believe it, shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Tell somebody you're great people. And you have great power. Tell somebody else we're great people. And we have great power. The Bible says, the Bible says, Genesis chapter 10 verse 6. Genesis chapter 10 verse 6. It says, the sons of Ham were Cush, Mizram, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Ham were put, Mishram, put, put in Canaan. I think that's slide number four. Can you put up slide number four for me? The sons of Ham were put, Mizram, and Cush, and Canaan. These are the sons of Ham. These are Ham's name in the Bible is Kim. And Kim means black. Hello in here, somebody. Ham's name in the Bible is Kim. And Kim means black. In the Bible, names weren't a derogatory. Like, for instance, you had twins. You didn't name them Crayola and Karana. And if they were boys, you didn't name them Washa and Dryer. But names had meanings. Names were descriptive. And a fact, if your walk with God changed during your life, as it did with Abraham and Sarah, as it did with Paul, God would change your name because your name was a description of who you are. That's why I heard the praise team say, a great name is to be valued over anything. Tell somebody, I'm going for a great name. Now, you have to look at this map. You have to look at this map because, unfortunately, in most of the Bibles, they don't show you the whole map. They just show you that little tiny corner of Saudi Arabia and that little tiny corner of Northeast Africa as if all the Bible happened on that little piece of land. Not so. So look at this. The descendants of Ham, somebody say the descendants of Ham were put, Mizram and Cush. Put in modern day English is Libya. Mizram is Egypt. And Cush is Ethiopia. Not modern Ethiopia, but closer to where Sudan is now. But these were the, and if you've ever seen somebody from the Sudan, that's Ham. 
put Mizram in Cush. Genesis 10 and 6, verse NIV says, the sons of Ham were Cush, Egypt, Cush, and Canaan. In the Amplified, it says, the sons of Ham, of Ham Cush, Mizram, from who descended the Egyptians, put in Canaan. In the, in the Good News Bible, it says, Genesis 10 and 6, it says, the sons of Ham were Cush, Egypt, Libya, and Canaan. They were the ancestors of the people who bear their names. So these sons of Ham, they went out. Put the map back up real quick. These sons of Ham, they went out and they settled territories. And these territories were named after them. Are y'all following me? Yes. These sons of Ham, Ham means black, went out and settled territories. And these territories were named after them. Why are you teaching this lesson, Pastor Blow? Because I need somebody in here to know that black people didn't just appear on the scene in 1619 when we showed up on the shores of the United States as, as slaves. That when we went from through the door of no return on the west coast of Africa, we were leaving something. Are y'all with me? Yes. So here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go. Are y'all still with me? Yes. Sons of Ham. Somebody say Cush, Cush. Egypt. Libya and Canaan. And these were the ancestors of the people who bear their name. Now, it kind of makes you rethink, understanding this, the significance of Hosea 11 and 1 and of Matthew 2 and 15. Hosea 11 and 1. Sorry, I didn't give that to you guys, but don't worry about it. Y'all have to find it. I'll read it to them. Hosea 11 and 1 and Matthew 2 and 15, God says in the Old Testament about the nation of Israel, he says, out of Egypt... One of the sons of Ham, and Egypt means sun-kissed people. Out of the sun-kissed people, I have called my son. Later in the New Testament, where he's talking about his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in Matthew 2.15, he says, again, he sent Joseph into Egypt to hide his son because he could be protected there from the Romans and from Herod. And then he says, out of Egypt... One of the descendants of Ham's territory, I have called my son. I need somebody to understand that people of African descent are not latecomers to the story of salvation. Tell somebody, we're not latecomers. Tell somebody, we've been there all the time with everybody else. Look at somebody else say, we've been there all the time with everybody else. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody say, all the time. Where everybody else. First Chronicles 1 and 8 says it like this. It says, and, and that's what I love about the Bible. That's why I love the book of Revelation. Because the Bible says you cannot add or take away from the word of God. You can draw pictures all you want. But you can't add or take away from the word of God. And tell somebody it's in the book. So here we go. Here we go. Here we go. First Chronicles chapter 1, verse 8. The Good News translation says, The sons of Ham were Cush, Egypt, Libya, and Canaan. They were the ancestors of the people who bear their name. First Chronicles 1 and 8 in the CEV says, Ham was the father of Ethiopia, Egypt, Put, Libya, and Canaan. And they were the ancestors of the kingdoms named after them. Can you put my, my map back up again? They were the ancestors of the kingdoms that were named after them. They were the ancestors of the kingdoms that were named after them. You and I just read black history right there. Ham was the father of Ethiopia. That's another name, that's another name for, uh, for, for, for Canaan. But Ham was the, I'm sorry, for, for Cush. Ham was the father of Ethiopia. Egypt put Libya and Canaan. And they were the ancestors of the kingdom named after them. Don't you know, beloved, that there are ancient African kingdoms that go back to 2000 B.C.? There's the Kerma civilization in Sudan and Egypt. There's the Egyptian empire and all its various pharaohs and Nubians. There's the kingdom of Cush in northern Africa. There's the kingdom of Aksum in Ethiopia from where the queen of Sheba came. There's the kingdom of Ifi in Nigeria. There's the Ghana empire that was on the horn of Africa. There's the Mali empire in West Africa. There's the kingdom of Songhai in West Africa. But the greatest kingdom that you and I ever can belong to is what the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 12 and 28. He says the unshakable kingdom. Is there anybody here who's glad that you are a part of the unshakable kingdom of the most high God? 
Because check this, all those kingdoms have risen and fallen. And all the kingdoms that are on the earth today will rise and fall. But the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 12 and 28 that we are receiving an unshakable kingdom. Let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. Is there anybody here who is a part of the unshakable kingdom? That's why I can sleep at night. I don't care what happens on CNN. I don't care what happens on MSNBC because I know that I'm not just a citizen of the United States, but I'm a citizen of heaven. I am an ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ, and I am a part of the unshakable kingdom. What shakes the world does not shake my God. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, what shakes the world does not shake our God. And guess what? Since my God is not shaken, tell somebody that I shall not be shaken. Tell somebody an unshakable kingdom. An unshakable kingdom. Don't you know? The Bible talks about two rivers going into the Garden of Eden. Four rivers all together. But two of them are in Ethiopia to this day. The Pishon and the Gion. And even archaeologists will tell you that the oldest human bones were discovered in Africa near the Kishon and the Gion River. And they date back several millennia. Y'all need to understand that people of, here's the thing, here's the thing. Ooh, 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 ooh. Now, <laughs> if God created Adam and Eve out of the dust of the earth and the garden was in Africa, hello in here. And then after the flood, he told Noah's three sons to be fruitful and multiply. But if it all started in the Garden of Africa, in the Garden of Eden, which was in Africa, then guess what? I don't care how the United States classifies us. All of us are of African descent. Somebody needs to shout hallelujah up in here. Because if we believe that from one blood, God created everybody, and he started with that one blood in a garden in Africa, then tell somebody, I'm home, I'm home, I'm home, I'm home. If we all have the same father, who is Adam in the natural, if we all sprung from Noah's sons after the flood, tell somebody, happy Black History Month. Racism is not a skin problem. Racism is a sin problem. And we as saints of God, we can't buy into that. I check other on everything now. We ask you black, white, other, I put other. And then if I ask what is other, I say child of God. Because that's who I am. Are there any other children of God in the house? Somebody say children of God. Yay! Children of God, children of God, can you shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah to the Lord of all time. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Put up slide five for me, fellas. Thank y'all for riding with me. Can we give a hand for the fellas in the booth? The land of hands. Somebody say the land of hands. All of this is what the Bible describes as the land of Ham. This is what the Bible describes as the land of Ham. And it's no issue. The majority of the biblical drama, Philistines, mosquito bites, Canaanites, Audites, happened on that stage. Y'all missing that? Y'all missing that? The vast majority of everything we read in the Old Testament happens somewhere on that stage in the land of Ham. Are y'all following me? The Bible says in Psalm 105, 23, that Israel arrived in Egypt, the land of Ham. Jacob lived as a foreigner in the land of Ham. Psalm 105, 27 says they perform miraculous signs among the Egyptians and wonders in the land of Ham. 
Psalm 106, 22 says, such wonderful things in the land of Ham, such awesome deeds at the Red Sea. Psalm 78, 51 says, he struck down all the firstborn of Egypt, the firstborn of manhood in the tents of Ham. So when you're reading the Exodus, when you're reading all that drama, when you're reading the story of Abraham, when you're reading the story of Isaac, when you're reading the story of Jacob, understand the stage on which those stories occurred was the land of Ham. So again, understand, beloved, that everybody, tell somebody everybody. everybody. One thing that I love about the Bible is that God makes sure that at crucial times in his word that everybody is there. On the day of Pentecost, tell somebody everybody there. Everybody. When you see them around the throne, it says from every tribe, language, nation, and tongue, everybody is there. Because God is a God. Look at this. God is not for anybody but himself. When, 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 when Jacob, God is not a God of Republicans, he's not a God of Democrats, he's not a God of Independents, he's not a God of Fox, he's not a God of MSNBC, he's not a God of CNN, he's a God of holiness. Remember, when, when Joshua was about to go into the promised land in Joshua chapter 6, and he saw an angel there, and he said, well surely this angel has come to defend me. And he says to the angels, whose side of you are you on? And he said, I'm not on anybody's side. But as the angel of God's army, I have now come. Tell somebody, it's never the question about whose side is God on. The question is always, who is on the Lord's side? And is there anybody here who's on the Lord's side? And God is looking for some people who come what may will declare, I'm on his side. I want if somebody can throw your hand up and say, I'm on God's side. I'm on God's side. Come what may, God and I, we roll like that. This is the way we roll. GP, are you with me? GP, are you with me? Got to love our praise team. They still giving God praise after their set is over. You got to love them. Here's the thing, beloved. The children of Israel spent 400 years in the land of Ham. They were there so long that the following words appear in the book of the prophet Amos, in Amos chapter 9, verse 7. Amos chapter 9, verse 7. God says, are you, talking about the Israelites, are you not as the sons of Ethiopia? To me, O sons of Israel, declares the Lord. The Roman historian Tacitus recorded this, that the early Jews were so African in their appearance that many people thought the Jews were a people of Ethiopian origin. Strabo reports that in his day, he's another Roman historian, Strabo reports that in his day, the prevailing opinion was that the ancestors of the Jews were the Egyptians. Amos 9 and 7, are you not like the people of Ethiopia to me, O children of Israel, says the Lord. And look what God, tell some, mm, thank you, Father. I love this verse. If you ever want to shout, go to Amos 9 and 7. Not just because of how it starts out. Are you not like the children of, Is of Ethiopia to me, O, o children of Israel? But what he says next, he says, God says, tell somebody, God is moving in everybody's life. He says, did I not bring the Israelites up from the land of Egypt, the Philistines up from Kaptor, and the Syrians from Kerr? In other words, God says, I've been moving in everybody's life. I've been making a way not just for one people, but I've been making a way for all people. Is there anybody here who can get to the point where you can't just, where you can get to the point where you cannot just celebrate what God is doing in your life, but I celebrate what God's doing in somebody else's life. I'm not just celebrating my business, but I'm celebrating your business. I'm not just celebrating my promotion, but I'm celebrating your promotion. That's what a body does. We get to the point where we say, oh, my neighbor's riding a new ride. Let me go over there and sell, hallelujah, over his new ride. We've got to get to the point where we understand God is moving in everybody's life. Tell your neighbor, God has more than just one child. Now, I may be his favorite. <laughs> Beloved, that's the way we got to feel. I borrowed that from Pastor D. Pastor D will say in a minute, God loves all y'all, but he loves me best. Y'all got to, we have to have that atmosphere that when I go before my father, my father is glad that I'm there. Somebody shout hallelujah. I'm going to let y'all go on this rainy day, but here we go. Genesis chapter 10, 10 verse 7. The sons of Cush, Ethiopia, were Seba, Havilah, Sapta, 
Ramah, and Septeca, and the sons of Ramah were Sheba and Dedan. Here we go. Genesis chapter 10, verse 8. Genesis chapter 10, verse 8. Cush, Ethiopia, fathered Nimrod. Cush, Ethiopia, fathered Nimrod. Nimrod was the first on earth to be a mighty man. Somebody missed that. Somebody missed that. One of Cush's sons, who is a son of Ham, whose name in Hebrew means black, one of the first people that the Bible describes as a great man, as a mighty man, also happens to be a man, a black man. Y'all missed that. Y'all missed that. Y'all missed that. Y'all missed that. The first mighty man described in the Bible. See, that's why, you, that's why your art history, tell somebody black history didn't begin in the United States. Yes, yes. Thank you back in the back. Thank you back in the last corner. I, I, I know that these type of messages make you uncomfortable. I, I know they make us squirm. But if you don't know your history, if you can't find yourself in the pages of Scripture, the devil can tell you anything. You'll start believing these people who tell you not nothing. And beloved, I come against every trick of the enemy over anybody in here. No matter what your ethnicity, you are. I got to go Jesse Jackson. Yes, you are somebody. Because like that bumper sticker says, God doesn't make no junk. Tell somebody, tell somebody when God made me, tell somebody he was having a good day. Tell you, know, that's how you got to feel. Tell someone God made me, he was having a good day. So, so here we go, here we go. So according to the scripture, I just showed you the, the progenity, the line. Ham, Cush, Cush's son was Nimrod, and Nimrod's son was the first heroic warrior on earth. He was the first mighty man on earth. Hello in here, somebody. He was the first hunter. But not only was he the first hunter, but the Bible says in Genesis chapter 10, verses 9 through 11, that since he was great, tell somebody great. Since he was a great hunter in the world, his name became a proverb. People would say, this man is like Nimrod, the greatest hunter in the world. And he was a builder. So somebody, he was a builder. He built his kingdom. He built his kingdom in the land of Babylonia with the cities of Babylon, Iraq, Akkad, and Kalna. From there, he expanded his territory to Assyria, building the cities of Nineveh, Rehoboth, and Calah. Tell somebody, put up, put up slide number six. Tell somebody, this is a great brother. But he was puffed up, though, because y'all know what happened at the Tower of Babel, which he built. When God told the people to fan out, they said, no, we're going to stay right here. You cannot let your greatness turn into arrogance. Because when your greatness turns into arrogance, God must check you. But he was an explorer. He was, a fir- he was an explorer. Somebody say, why, why do you have this up here? Leave it up here. I want y'all to see these pictures. The first great civilization were African civilizations. I'm talking about the city of Thebes, which stood from 2050 B.C. to 661 years before the birth of Jesus. I'm talking about Memphis from 3100 B.C. in ancient Egypt. I'm talking about even modern empires such as Ghana, which stood from 700 to 1200 B.C., Mali, which stood from 1200 to 1500 B.C., and Sangai, which I'm... A.D., uh, 1200, 1500 A.D., and Songhai from 1350 to 600, 1600 A.D. Now, tell somebody, we, got, we have to get to the point, beloved, where when we share history, we just tell the whole story. Tell somebody, because we're better together. Because every people group on earth has made contribution to the, to the global society. Hello, and somebody, somebody shout, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every, every, every people group on earth has made contributions to the global uplift, if you will. The man on the left is a man named Abu Bakari. Abu Bakari. I've been practicing that all night. Abu Bakari. You probably didn't learn about Abu Bakari in school. Abu Bakari was the prince of Mali, but he liked to sail his ships. He liked to take his boats all over the world. And Abu Bakari traveled to the present-day United States of America, not the Caribbean. 
Abu Bakari tra traveled to modern day to what is now the United States of America. But guess what? He traveled there in 1311 with a fleet of ships and traded with the indigenous people on the east coast of the United States. Abu Kari never claimed to discover these lands because he already knew they were there. Columbus, the man on the right, did not arrive in what we now call the Caribbean until 1492, which was 181 years later. The pilgrims did not arrive until 1620, 309 years after Abu Kari. Tell somebody, beloved, you got to tell the whole story. Look at somebody and say, do your children know that? We know 1492, but we do know, we know I got to make up a rhyme for 1311. <laughs> tell somebody, the descendants, of, the descendants of Ham. In fact, beloved, in the diary of Christopher Columbus, he writes this. He says, the Africans know a way to the West. Y'all missed that. Christopher Columbus writes in his diary, the Africans know a way to the West. He says, but their way goes around the doldrums, and we will never survive. My sailors in the house know that doldrums is a nautical term that refers to the belt around the equator where sailing ships sometimes get stuck because the winds don't blow regularly. So, in other words, Columbus says the Africans have found a short way there, but they've also found a way to sail where there's nothing to blow the sails. Y'all, y'all miss that. So that not just speaks to that not just speaks to knowledge, but that speaks to technology. Y'all missing that? <laughs> Somebody's gonna get this in public. You gonna be going down aisle four? You like, oh my god! <laughs> Even 800 years before Columbus. The Nubian Egyptians were trading with the Olmecs of central Mexico. Throw up slide number seven. So here's my last thing, and we'll be about ready to go. I'm glad it's raining since we don't have no way to go, and there's no football game. No March Madness yet. No, bat, no NBA playoffs until May. So I'm good. Amen. Genesis chapter 10, verse 8. Genesis chapter 10, verse 8. Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. Kenneth Walters said it like this, and I quote, he says, so Nimrod was a great ruler, provider, and builder. And this is important. But Nimrod, the son of an Ethiopian, is important not just because he was the first man on earth to be a mighty man, but also because he was an African black man. Someone will ask, how do you know that Nimrod was a black man? I know because the Bible says that Nimrod was the son of Cush, and Cush the son of Ham, and Ham was the father of all black African people because his Hebrew name is Kim, which means the Egyptian word for blackened by the sun. Therefore, because Nimrod was the son of Cush, the son of Ham, we know that he was an African black man. This is highly significant that the first man on earth to be a mighty man was a black man. And if the first man on earth to be a mighty man was a black man, then the first people on earth to be a mighty people were black people. And the first nations on earth to be mighty nations were black nations. Look at your neighbor and say, this is history. And that's why we have to know our history. And that's why I love this Bible. Because the Bible says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Don't you? That's why they did not want this Bible in the hands of slaves. Because there's no way that you can stay in shackles when you got this word. This word raised up Martin Luther King. This word raised up Mega Evans. This word raised up Harriet Tubman. This word raised up every preacher that's ever preached and taught. This word Word raised up the abolitionists. This word raised up Frederick Douglass. It's because of the word. Tell somebody it's because of the word. Look into David and say, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You can't stay in bondage if you've got this word. Somebody shout hallelujah for the word. Woo, sorry about that. So, the descendants, I want to show you one more thing. And look at what they say, and, they, and so somebody, greatness had nothing to do with race. Because race, again, is a modern construct that was foreign to the people of the Bible times. If you ever have a chance today, Google the Conference of Berlin to find out how Africa got in its current condition. Google the Conference of Berlin. I don't have time to go into that today. But Google it when you get home. Genesis chapter 10, verse 4 and 5. 
It says, you know, I, I told you I'd be switching back and forth between Pastor Dave and Professor Dave today. The descendants of Javoth were Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, and Rodanim. <laughs> now, y'all know when y'all see them names, those sound like some West Baltimore names, don't they? <laughs> y'all go ahead and laugh. They, that sounds like, sound like some Bronx, New York names, don't they? <laughs> yeah. Their descendants became seafaring people, which spread out to various lands. Each identified, look at this, by its own language, clan, and national identity. Genesis 10 and 20 says these were the descendants of Ham, identified by language, territory, and national identity. Genesis 10 and 31 says these are the descendants of Shem, identified by clan, language, territory, and national identity. Race is never a factor in the word of God. The only way that people are filed away is by clan, who your family is, language, what comes out of your mouth, territory, where you live, and national identity, where you come from. Hello in here, somebody. Because God is not concerned about race. There's no such thing as race. Race is a lie hatched in the pit of hell. We are all children of the Most High God. And when God made each and every one of us in his image, and he said that it is very good. I need you to elbow somebody and say, you are very good. Short hair or long hair, somebody say very good. Dark skin or light complexion, somebody say very good. Kinky hair or straight hair, somebody say very good. No hair or weave in your hair, somebody say very good. When God made us, he made us very good. Somebody needs to lift your hands and thank God for making us very good. So, the last thing I'm going to say is that we got to have a Tony, Tony the Tiger theology. Anybody grew up on Kellogg's cereal? Anybody know Tony the Tiger? Frosted Flakes good? They're great! Mama, can we get some Frosted Flakes? They're great! Anybody remember generics? We just had Sugar Flakes. Mama, these ain't Frosted Flakes! Ain't no tiger on the box. These sugar flakes, they not great. Where Tony? <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, Kingdom of God good? Tell somebody it's great. Look at somebody else and say, Kingdom of God good? Tell somebody it's great. And I need everybody in this house to awake to the great. Tell somebody awake to the great. Look at your name and say, awake to the great. Joshua spoke to the house of Joseph. I'm going to put it in modern terms. Blow spoke to the house of R O L C C Palm Bay, saying, you are a great people and you have great power. You shall not have only one lot. Blow said, why settle for less when God's got more? Is there anybody here who believes that God's got more? I need you to stand on your feet and give God some praise. I need you to stand on your feet and give God some glory. Look at your neighbor and say, God's got more. God's got more. God's got more. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Find a neighbor. Find a neighbor. Help me preach to them. Put your hand by your ear and get sound like an old Baptist preacher. Help me preach to your neighbor. Say neighbor. neighbor. Say neighbor. neighbor. Get your Baptist scrawl on. Say neighbor. neighbor. Yeah, y'all got it. Say neighbor. neighbor. And the text says that God's got more. Then one lot for you. Oh, Lord. It said, neighbor. It says, the mountain country shall be yours. Although it's wooded, you're going to cut it down to its farthest extent. Say, neighbor. You're going to drive out the Canaanites. Though they have iron chariots and though they're strong, tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, you're going on up. A little bit higher. Say, neighbor, we're going on up a little bit higher. Is there anybody here who's ready for God to take you on up a little bit higher? And say, neighbor, say, neighbor, say, neighbor, there's some parasites there, and there's some Canaanites there, and they have iron chariots. But you just got to say, in the name of Jesus, move, get out the way, get out the way, tell everything that's standing between you and your destiny, move, get out the way, get out the way, 
Somebody shout yes. Somebody shout yes. Somebody shout yes. Look at your neighbor and say neighbor. Say neighbor. Say neighbor. The first Joshua, the son of Nun, got his people into the promised land. Say, but neighbor, flip over to the New Testament and read about the second Joshua. The second Joshua did more than that. He got his people into the promise. Is there anybody here who can thank God that he got you into the promise? Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, all the promises of God are yes and amen. Yes and amen. Won't he do it? Yes and amen. Won't he make the way? Yes and amen. Won't he open the door? Yes and amen. Won't he heal your body? Yes and amen. Won't he make the enemy your footstool? Yes and amen. I need somebody who believes God to lift your hands and say, Father, all your promises are yes and amen. If you believe it, throw your head back and give God 25 seconds of your best praise. 25 seconds of your best glory. Somebody shout yes. Somebody shout yes. Somebody shout yes. Somebody shout yes. Somebody declare there's greatness in me. So I say there's greatness in me. Now find somebody say, neighbor, there's greatness in you. Turn around, find one more person. Say there's greatness in us. Say, neighbor, I see greatness in you. I see greatness in me. So we agree. And if two of us on earth agree about anything, then that very thing will be done by our Father who is in heaven. Do you agree that you're a great people? Do you agree that you have great power? Then throw your head back and give the Lord 25 seconds of your best praise, 25 seconds of your best glory. Somebody, anybody, everybody, scream.